Hello, and welcome to WooStream, bringing Willamette to you. My name is Tiffany Newton, and I'm the Director of Alumni and Parent Engagement here at Willamette University. Today's conversation features Robin Merrill, Visiting Assistant Professor of Law at Willamette University's College of Law. Professor Merrill initially joined Willamette as a visiting professor from the Human Rights Campaign, where she served as the Associate Legal Director for the past five years, her work at the HRC focused on federal programs, administrative policies, and legislation that impacted LGBTQIA mm -hmm. communities. Her scholarship primarily focuses on non-discrimination protections and religious freedom, and she will join the College of Law in a tenure-track position beginning next academic year. We're so thankful. Our discussion today will focus on the recent laws and legal challenges that seek to endanger and criminalize gender-affirming care while also sharing information on why healthcare is a leading issue for trans, non-binary, and genderqueer communities. We will review healthcare disparities and other related topics as we seek to address why healthcare is and should be treated as a human right. Professor Merrill, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me about this area of your work, especially as we consider how prevalent these discriminatory laws are in our country and how serious the risks are to some of the most vulnerable members of our society, especially trans youth. Thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for joining. I'm really, I'm thrilled to be at William and I'm thrilled to be here this evening. So first things first to kind of broaden the introduction that I had just shared, could you tell us a little bit about your professional journey to date and how you came to Willamette Law? Yes. Um, so I started my career as a presidential management fellow at the Department of Housing and Urban Development um, and moved to HRC um, in 2011, where I was privileged to serve until I um, gave in my notice and began teaching as a visitor um, last spring remotely from my attic in DC. Um, and my, I, I think as you mentioned, my work at HRC primarily focused on um, administrative and regulatory um, advocacy and legislative affairs, particularly around LGBTQ folks and healthcare access. Um, and interestingly, issues of religious liberty and non-discrimination sort of weave their way into that healthcare access and coverage question um, time and time again. Um, and I think issues, other issues around um, social services, including um, issues of poverty and housing uh, housing insecurity and um, food insecurity all really feed into exacerbating um, the health disparities that our community faces every day. So I was very privileged to work on that, um, both um, on the executive side and in Congress. Thank you. And so how, speaking of starting teaching from your, um, <laughs> from DC, how has it gone, your, your transition to Willamette and your welcome to the community here in Oregon? I am thrilled to be physically in the classroom and to actually be able to see my students. Um, it was, it, it's just fantastic. Um, you know, I've been blown away by, from the moment I got here, how kind and welcoming everyone at Willamette is from the students to staff to um, the faculty. Um, and definitely we're leaning into Oregon. Um, my my seven year old, I said, you know, I was driving him to school a couple of weeks ago, and I was saying, you know, aren't we grateful that we're in this amazing place, and I have this great job, and aren't we grateful? And he he said, yes, it's great. It rains a lot. That's disappointing. And it was like, okay, well, true. Um, but I bought them waiters, and they're fine. Um, so so yes, um, really have loved. Um, getting to know and be in person, all of the amazing faculty and staff and students. Um, and just so excited to have the opportunity to join full-time next year. We're so thankful to have you. And I know you talked about how you kind of started from the housing first angle. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how you came to this kind of research focus and how this became central to what you're working on and what you're bringing to Willamette. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yes, I started at HUD, um, where I focused on um, access, access to um, neighborhoods of opportunity and increasing access to um, stable supportive housing and permanent supportive housing. Um, and I think 
what I really, um, how I ended up here and doing this work over the last 10 years at HRC and interested in um, specifically my research is looking at um, non-discrimination provisions and religious liberty. But I think that I really see it in this broader context of um, making sure that people's needs are met um, and that you can, everything else sort of can fall into place once you have basic needs met around issues like housing and healthcare and nutrition. Um, and that's why I'm so passionate about non-discrimination provisions, um, because I think that often um, they are sort of billed as extra rights or um, a luxury. But I think that non-discrimination provisions, what we're really talking about are lifeline federal programs and services, right? We're talking about social security, we're talking about SNAP, we're talking about um, HUD housing. Um, and all of that I really see is feeding into um, closing the health disparity gap, the health disparities that we have in among the LGBT population specifically, and, and I think particularly um, in folks that are living at the intersection of marginalized identities. Um, so LGBTQ um, communities of color, folks that are low income, um, face different um, challenges and barriers to success and barriers to healthcare access um, that I just, I, I believe it really undermines the ability for people to live full and um, full and participating lives in their community. I, I, I don't think participating is the right verb there, but um, to, to actually be contributing members of the world. And I think we all miss out when people um, can't do that. And, I, and as someone who has a social work background, I would say also we realize that social support programs, means testing is involved. We kind of have this idea of like deserving poor versus maybe those undeserving of support, um, you know, maybe misguided conceptions around agency or who really has that and, and how that works within these interlocking systems. So I, I very much appreciate that perspective. And I want to start with the beginning because we have folks online who maybe are very personally tied to this topic, have been dealing with some of this for a long time. And then there are, I'm sure, others who have maybe not heard of trans-inclusive healthcare, what we even mean by that. So I was wondering if you could kind of start at the beginning and just talk about what, how you define healthcare from your perspective and aspirationally, and then we can get into some of the types, you know, trans-inclusive, transition, supporting, those kinds of things. Absolutely. Um, so I think healthcare is, I see as both preventative um, and urgent services that enable um, people to live healthy, full lives. Um, healthcare, again, can um, be any, it can have a very broad definition, again, coming from a housing first model of housing as healthcare, um, sometimes the first treatment cascade that you're going to have um, when treating um, substance abuse or mental health issues or HIV and AIDS is going to be housing, right? Um, but I think the traditional understanding of healthcare is actually delivery of um, health-related services. So um, preventative care and screening, um, response to urgent needs, et cetera. Um, I think it's also really important to include mental health care access, um, both urgent and preventative. I think that um, often that can, that and substance abuse uh, prevention and care can be get really swept under the rug or not get as much attention as it deserves. Um, but I think that both mental health and substance abuse and physical health care um, really go hand in hand, especially when you're talking about vulnerable populations um, that are dealing with minority stress and discrimination on a daily basis that can really compound those mental health and substance abuse issues. Um, as far as um, the healthcare, health accessing the healthcare system as um, a transgender individual, I think I really see it as two separate, um, two separate models. I think the first being the importance of trans inclusive healthcare. And what we mean by trans inclusive healthcare is making sure that healthcare providers of all stripes from um, 
you know, from orthopedics to emergency care doctors um, to ophthalmologists, understand how, under have a basic cultural competence of who trans people are. And that's really um, a very baseline issue. Um, you know, we hear horror story after horror story of people who are turned away from accessing urgent care. For example, I, we, I, um, had, a, I had a story from someone who had, was in an accident, broke their leg and was turned away from, from an emergency room because the doctor said, we don't know how to serve trans people. Right. And it was a broken leg. So I think there's a very baseline level of care um, of making sure that people have that cultural competence. Um, after that sort of level of understanding and empathy, and also, I think, um, making sure that folks have enough training that they don't discriminate because no one, no one goes into health, the healthcare profession with the desire to discriminate. I just don't believe it. It is too hard of a job. <laughs> it takes, it's just, it's just the people that go into healthcare are compassionate, giving people that want to provide the best for their patients. And I think that providing um, anti-discrimination training and cultural competence really equips them to do their job the best they can. Um, so there's that preventative. Oh, and also as part of the um, cultural competence, one of, one of the issues in addition to basically understanding um, that trans people exist and they need to have their broken leg set, um, also just a basic understanding of um, sort of common treatments like hormone therapy. Um, you know, I had a good friend who was in a skiing accident and had to be hospitalized and wasn't given access to his hormone therapy that he had been taking for a number of years. Um, and, and the hospital just wouldn't provide it. Um, and as anybody knows who's not on any maintenance medication, you can't just stop taking your maintenance medication. And so I think really communicating to hospitals um, and care providers that prescriptions like that need to be um, continued. On the other side of that trans-inclusive model, making sure that people feel like they can um, seek necessary care and preventative, and preventative services, then we have a conversation about transition-related care. And that's what's been in the news an awful lot this state legislative season. Um, Transition-related care is care that's directly tied to an individual who is going through a gender transition or who has transitioned and is on maintenance medication. Um, and so there's, there, there, I see them as really two different but complementing um, ways that trans people access healthcare in America. And I would agree that the experiences I've had with former clients and, and people in my um, social circle, it, it has been as simple as having them use the right name or having a spot on a form where they can put in the name that, that is appropriate for them to knowing that someone who was assigned male at birth might need a different annual exam than, you know, what you might see when they walk into your office as a trans woman, those kinds of things to anything from the denial of care in an emergency situation and, and just trying to find someone who know the gatekeeping that can happen, whether it's through insurance, employer-based healthcare yeah. plans, or, you know, healthcare organizations that have a religious um, body that they report to and, and that limit maybe how they help people. And if that's the only option in the rural place where you grow up, that can be another factor as well. And I'm sorry, I just, I'm sharing some of the ones that I have seen or interacted yeah. with. From no, absolutely. I'm, I'm so glad, and I know that we're going to talk about it, but I'm, I'm so yeah. glad you brought up the healthcare coverage issue um, because I think that is one of the um, biggest, because I think there are a couple of different ways that people get sort of shut out of care. Mm -hmm. And one of them is obviously these state ledge attacks that restrict access. But the biggest is money and coverage. Um, so 
And I know we're going to talk about that, so I won't, I won't let the cat out of the bag, but I'm really, I'm, I'm really excited to talk about that and um, the different models of coverage that are available. So, And so, you know, we're going to start with aspirational and then get into some of the details. So in a perfect world, what do you think healthcare, you know, what, what would healthcare look like if people could access it, that kind of thing from this perspective? Yeah. Um, so I think that, Every doctor, this is my aspirational, every doctor would recognize that trans people exist and would exist in their practice, even if, if they are in a, as you know, I grew up in a very rural part of Oklahoma, even in a rural, you know, community health center, making sure that everybody has that cultural competence um, to meet people where they are, to know what additional risk factors um, folks might be bringing in with them um, as a result of minority stress or other other issues. Um, and a very baseline non-discriminatory environment where people feel like they can seek that preventative care. Um, and, you know, we know that um, that is not a baseline that we currently have. Um, I think the most recent um, survey of that um, the national U.S. National Trans Survey did was that 70% of trans people experienced discrimination in the healthcare setting. 70%. And it includes things, not only, it, it includes just delivery of care issues, harsh treatment, rough language, refusal to actually provide the care, right? Um, so I think, as a baseline, ideally, someone would be able to know that they could seek the care they need. Because what we do know is that when you have that 70% of people that have personal stories of discrimination, they don't go the next time. And they don't go the next time. They go when they're really sick. And that is just not a good healthcare model, right? That's just not a public health model. Um, so I think that is a baseline. Um, and then I think also it's important um, to make sure that people have access to transition related care um, that's that's culturally competent and affordable. Um, and that goes into, um, I think, coverage um, from private insurance companies, Medicare and Medicaid. Um, Medicaid in particular now has um, coverage, but each um, each insurance provider has a different sort of set of standards um, that they will cover. So um, the IRS um, in 2010 <laughs> came down and said, yes, transition related care is medically is, is a medical necessity. Um, and what that did was mean that insurance companies, we're more likely to provide it um, than if it was a cosmetic um, cosmetic issue. But interestingly, not you know, transition related care is sort of this umbrella term for a myriad of um, procedures that may be surgical, but most are not. Um, treatments um, like hormone therapy, um, things like that. So um, you know, it's, it's definitely not a one size fits all experience for everyone at all. Um, and everyone, every individual approaches it in an individual way. Um, so I think making sure that regardless of where you're getting your insurance coverage, whether it be through Medicare and Medicaid, whether it be through the veterans, veterans, um, health administration, um, whether it be FEHB that you have, um, the access that you need. Um, and you don't have to necessarily piece together um, your care. Um, and then also, I think you, you, had, you had talked about actually getting coverage for services that you need, which I think seems really basic, but it's an issue that I worked on in practice extensively because part of a, a big issue was um, once someone would transition Medically, and they would have um, their gender marker on their insurance form be their gender, um, their, their um, gender assigned at birth would then disappear. But then what would happen is that then when the insurance company would code it, 
um, they wouldn't necessarily get all of the services that they needed um, in the body that they lived in. So for example, um, a big issue is um, trans men that for preventative care reasons need a pap smear once a year, but the, the insurance coding wouldn't work for, for those um, gender specific issues. So um, that was actually something very technical that sort of we had to go in and fix with individual insurance companies, um, which is extremely hard. Um, but a good way to do that, we, we worked with um, the Federal Employee Health Benefits Plan, FEHB, that then through OPM sort of sets the standard for most private insurance providers. So, But it's interesting that it takes that level of expertise even to, to negotiate something that, you know, it, it should be a healthcare first, you know, focusing on patient wellness, what they need to be healthy and to thrive at this moment. And then it becomes this thing, well, where, how is it coded? Who's paying for it? Does this make sense? How do we track that? You know, it, 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 it just can become a much bigger snowballing effect than just, I would just like to go into my office and have my yearly, whatever I need addressed. Oh, it's crazy. It's crazy. And I think that um, the, the burden, it, it's, it's better now because FEHB um, does provide um, has standard of care that you are able to get um, cross-matched um, services. Um, but still to figure out if your insurance company provides the coverage that you need for this specific procedure that you're having, because again, it's not, there are, are a couple, um, people spend hours and hours and hours on the phone. Um, and that's why it's such a, it, it's easier if you can make an individual pro problem, a macro, pro pro a macro problem and sort of go in from the top and just try to fix it from the top down. Cause otherwise the, the burden on individuals is untenable. And it can lead to them having to make very serious life decisions based on what, you know, where they can live to access the care that they need where they can work to have an insurance plan that will meet their needs, all, all kinds of different considerations come into well, that as well. You know, and if they can use FMLA coverage um, for transition related care, and even if they can use FMLA coverage, which they can, if you're listening to this, you can, um, because we don't have protections on the basis of transgender status in many states, um, the act of coming out to your employer in order to get your FMLA coverage exposes you to the risk of discrimination and lawful firing. So we, cause we do have it under title seven, which is great. Um, but I, but we don't have the universal um, top down federal legislation that would make it clear and not litigious. So in transitioning, cause we, we've kind of set the stage gone through a couple of definitions, what we mean by trans-inclusive care versus very specific transition-related care, how those overlap but differ or depending upon, you know, where someone is in their life, what they're going through, what they're they're trying to accomplish. And there are so many news pieces out there about mm -hmm. healthcare, calling them bans, healthcare bans, um, you know, legal challenges to this. Could you talk through what what they mean just by ban and kind of the different versions of these laws and these legal actions that we're seeing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think you you were spot on that every every person's transition story is unique and individual, and the care that they access depends. The, you know, the biggest factor is going to be age. Um, at the time that you transition. Um, and so a lot of these bans that we're seeing, for example, um, there was a ban proposed in Alabama. Um, the um, memo from Governor Abbott in Texas, for folks that aren't familiar with this, Governor um, Abbott provided a memo to the state child welfare agency saying that any parent that was engaging in transition really, or allow, basically taking their child to receive transition related care and supporting them in that decision, um, that counted as child abuse, um, that they could be investigated um, and separated from their child. Um, you know, I think that what people really miss here when we're talking about trans youth is that 
for the bulk of people, especially the under nine crowd, um, we're talking about a social transition, right? We're talking about um, gender affirming counseling, affirming clothing options, making sure that their first grade teacher calls them by the right name. Things that are not medically, as far as clinically and, and physically medically, their mental health care, but um, no one is giving, um, no one is doing gender affirming surgery on someone under 18. It's just, it's, it's very rare. Um, it just doesn't happen. Once you are um, looking at puberty, if you are a transgender child, your family might consider um, hormone blockers, which would um, basically pause puberty and give you a chance to um, live a bit before your body goes through and transitions to a gender that you are that does not, um, that is not authentic and doesn't sort of reflect who you are. Um, and that's really a best practice. Um, and then for adults, adults will, can, can go through gender affirming surgery. And so I think that it's, it's frustrating to see politicians, um, you know, and I should say also that hormone blockers, you know, the Mayo Clinic, um, NYU, they are safe, they're effective. And it's reversible. Um, it's just, it's, 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 th there's only a benefit um, to allowing a transgender child to have hormone blockers um, while they grow up. So, um, yes, so there's all that. And then um, for adults seeking care, there are different surgical options um, that go hand in hand with medical, with um, mental health care. And, and I would add in the context in which I supported clients going through this, there um, were, while there may not be any issues with hormone blockers, the mental health um, considerations can be very high for teenagers, for youth who are, who are considering or, yes. you know, going through this process and just the, the fear that can go through having a body that's changing in ways that they may not accept or, or that are incongruent with how they view themselves, how they identify, um, and, and the suicide ideation, mm -hmm. you know, numbers and, and attempt rates really climb during that time for children who identify as non-binary or, you know, questioning trans. And that's another consideration I know a lot of parents and loved ones and, and supporters make and, and healthcare practitioners when they're trying to see what's fast for an individual situation yeah. based on all given factors. Um, and so in, in thinking about this, you know, in 2021, 22 states introduced legislation. I dropped the infographic to everyone so they could see the different, the different angles from criminalizing healthcare practitioners for even offering mm -hmm. some of the services to criminalizing parents for supporting their children through these or, or guardians of any kind through these positions. And there's just so much there. And I'm wondering if you could just, you know, dive into one or two examples to kind of it, it, give us a, an example of what, what we mean by this. Cause it's, yeah. uh, it's really blown, blown up. It's not the right word, but very, much increased as someone who's paid attention to this issue for a long time, it seems so much more prevalent. Each legislative season that comes, I feel like comes with more assaults on transgender people, specifically trans kids, which are, are they're already the most vulnerable part of our community. And so a couple of different things. So I think you might hear a lot about trans sports bands. Um, so I think that also, as far as the sort of the attack on trans youth and you have trans sports bands um, that prohibit trans girls from participating in, in sports at school and trans boys from participating in sports at school. Um, but I think that the, there are different approaches that states have taken to um, restricting access to care. So I think one is that criminalization of providers um, of care, which has caused clinics to close, right? Clinics that have been operating for two decades, um, successfully transforming individual children's lives are having to close. 
Um, and then you also have Governor Abbott's approach, which is um, creating and characterizing parents as child abusers. And I think that even if, as with any social legislation, um, even if it turns out to be unconstitutional or it turns out to be just not enforceable or wrong, I think that's my thing with Governor Abbott's child abuse. It's just, I also teach family law and it's just not child abuse. Um, it has a, the effect on the community is profound. And I think it has a chilling effect on affirming parents um, that want to provide the best for their children and a chilling effect on providers in the community that want to continue to serve their community. Um, it also just cannot be overstated the impact on youth um, who see their leaders attacking them and othering them and making them into the enemy. Because I think that is the other thing that's um, deeply sad and unfortunate is this idea that governors are turning children into enemies of public health or enemies of national security. Um, yeah, it's, well, it's pretty awful. And especially when it's, it's um, positioned as a safety issue not recognizing the safety of usually the child that's most vulnerable in that situation, which is the, the trans child and, and yeah. making well, and them seem like weird other, or maybe a, a, a risk to their peers or to other, you know, as in trying to build their yeah. social connections and make friends and just survive middle school and high school and everything else that's really difficult. Well, and that's what I always also say is, they're also supposed to be taking the SATs, you know? And it's it's one of those, how are our youth supposed to thrive if they have to also, if they're spending all of this emotional energy on just trying to be authentic? Um, so, yeah. So in, in diving into this more, because we said that we would talk about the access piece even mm -hmm. more, in this context, when you're thinking about clinics closing, practitioners being worried, uh, you know, if, if they'll be liable in some way, you know, current, moving forward or retroactively, depending upon mm -hmm. how if things are um, addressed, parents and caregivers, or even, you know, the, the foster care system or yeah. all of these other things that we have where there is some duty to protect some guardianship authority some, you know, because social yeah. workers would have that too. I, I mean, you would be working with children who might need these services. And if you're the guardian based on the court decisions, like how yeah. do you navigate that professionally and appropriately with that child's best interest at heart? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's one of the things that we see with, um, in the foster care context, um, that there isn't actually current, there aren't currently protections for trans youth in care. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, laws like this might restrict a well-meaning foster parent or um, group home, but what it also does is sort of embolden, I think, Foster families that, again, no one goes into foster care because they hate children, it's sort of like my healthcare thing. Like, um, I think people become foster parents because they are compassionate, amazing people. Um, that being said, we do know that some foster parents won't let their child socially transition even, you know, won't let them, won't call them by their um, correct name, won't let them wear the right clothes um, and sometimes we'll put them through conversion therapy or um, Christian counseling and there aren't restrictions on that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think when you look at the risk and that's why I think um, you, and as a social worker, I'm sure you know this better than I do that, you know, trans youth um, are at a in hugely increased risk of being in group home settings um, and I should say also cross-sex group home settings. So for, so I'm talking about trans girls that are then set in, sent to um, boys' group homes that then 
suffer intense um, violence and harassment um, and eventually age out of the system. So um, it's really a, it's a no-win situation for when you're talking about um, trans youth healthcare when they don't have an advocate. Well, and, and we see that so much in the numbers just from my own experience, you know, we transitional age youth. So folks who are in care, but also about to age out of the system mm -hmm. or, you know, in the midst of high school, if they had had failed placements that yeah. weren't safe for them or weren't affirming of their identity, um, we would have children that ran away that saw oh. other other community, other support, safety in whatever form that that made sense to them at that time, even if it was something that, you know, from your perspective, a privileged perspective mm -hmm. seemed very scary and even more at risk. Um, it, you know, there were just so many facets to those issues. And also, like you said, not having appropriate facilities or supports or programs mm -hmm. for children. And so they might be in a men's shelter. They might be somewhere exactly. where it's absolutely inappropriate or end up in the juvenile justice system because they're seen as non-compliant when really they're just advocating for their own safety and identity. And, and yeah. so that can be another facet. I know we want to give enough time for people to start asking questions. So we'll, we'll kind of Yes. or moving towards our wrap up, but we've touched on it a bit. I, I wonder if you could talk a bit about, we've talked about children, but especially trans people of color and trans women of color, mm -hmm. how their, their experiences are exacerbated by intersecting systems of power, privilege, oppression. I mean, all, all, you know, systems that have historically excluded them, all, all of that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, people that are living at that intersection of being a trans woman of color um, face unbelievable violence on a daily basis. Um, and I think it varies greatly based on um, socioeconomic level. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much money you have if you're in Baltimore, which has a, a really an epidemic of violence against trans women. Um, if you're waiting for the bus, there's just nothing, nothing that protects you. Um, so I think what we do know is that folks that are living at that intersection um, are at higher risk, especially youth ages 13 to 24, are at really, really high risk of um, contracting HIV AIDS. Um, we have higher risks of um, issues like sex work and things like that. Um, and I think that on top of that, the physical violence and harassment that people endure on a daily basis um, absolutely undermines um, the ability to, to live and function. Um, so, yeah. And, and in the data, we're seeing life um, expectancy differences of maybe 10, 20, 30. I mean, I mean, it's not yeah. just a short, you know, oh, maybe it's a, a few months or a year or two. And it can depend on your zip code, race, the city in which you live, or if you're in an a urban versus mm -hmm. rural context. But this can be, you know, cutting someone's life expectancy almost in half depending upon. Well, and I think that it's important to, to note that you know, because I think that often that statistic is flipped mm. and used as ammunition of, see, that's why you don't want your kids to be trans, or that's why you don't want your kids to be queer. And that's not the problem. Somebody's gender identity isn't causing this. It is the societal pressure and discrimination and minority stress um, that sort of causes this cascade of health disparities and a lower life expectancy. Um, and I just think that's, I think that's really important to note because I think there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with trans people. Trans people are born as per, I was going to say perfect humans, but there are no perfect humans. Uh, they are born as perfectly as humans are born. There's nothing. And, and sort of that lower life expectancy and it's, is a result of the world that we live in. Yeah.
And, and just the severity of the issues that they're up against and the fact that so many of the decisions that are made about their lives or the programs that are supposedly for them um, don't center their agency, bodily autonomy, or you know, self-determination, don't fully consider the spectrum of folks within mm-hmm. those communities and their varied needs, historical experiences, intergenerational trauma, poverty. I mean, there's so many yeah. different things that come into that. And I, we often go for, oh, well, we must protect the kids without realizing, well, that should expand to all kids. And what does that mean? And what does that look like? And how can we as a society do better when we know what, better? What I also, I know that we're pushing up and I really want to hear from folks, but um, we've talked a lot about youth. I think it's also important to talk about folks at the other end of life, um, that trans elders are at increased risk for um, social isolation, um, discrimination in general health care, but also in the long-term care context and accessing that end of life care um, is really huge. So that. That also is there. And then also. <laughs> well, and especially in a service provider context or a living, like a lot of, it, it's a more recent switch, but a lot of um, aging in place policies, um, senior care organizations, living situations would not have gender affirming care or even places that would accept, L, you know lesbian by gay couples, let alone someone who might need additional considerations as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, So before we, you know, we've got 15 minutes left. I just want everyone to know that they're welcome to share their questions via the chat or the Q and a feature, but you know, is there anything else that you want to offer as kind of a final thing before we get into that Q and a piece here? Um. I'm trying, I, I think it's important. It's, this has been a lot of um, the hardships of going through healthcare and, and, and accessing healthcare. And, and I think that it's hard at times um, to leave room for joy and the beauty of living authentically and um the moments that we can celebrate. And so, you know, I just, I I do want to make sure that we do that as well, because I think that also having, um, when, when all trans kids here are lower life expectancy rates and people are going to discriminate against you and all this stuff, like, though that's not, not true, but it's also not the whole story. And I think that, um, what is different in 2022 versus, I mean, when I came out as queer in 20, in 2000 and I don't know, I'm old, 2005, um, is that we have so many more queer and trans role models across the government and in the media. um, And that there is so much joy to be had. And um, there are so many people that are fighting for, trans youth ability to thrive and do what they want to do. Um, and I think that that's a really important message for folks. Especially that statistics don't have to be their story that, that, right. that, you know, you, you can help inform them as you would with any child to try and make them understand the world around them, how best to navigate it as safely as possible. What, it, you know, extra considerations they need to take depending upon maybe their own personal vulnerabilities or the the situational context that they live in um, without it just being doom and gloom and not yeah. being the wonderful creative opportunities that I, you know, it makes me think and it sounds silly, but like when I think of TV shows when I was growing up in the nineties and, and stuff versus like seeing Pose or something that is really celebratory, um, yeah. you know, ball culture or things that came out of finding homes and alternate support structures mm-hmm. and in community and what people have gone from and how that legacy is built towards where we're at today and hopefully what will be a brighter and better future tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so we're still waiting for questions com- to come in, but don't worry, I have plenty if, if there's no one else. <laughs> that wasn't. And so 
My understanding is that this is something where we have a lot of legislative folks who are making decisions when they are not healthcare folks or social workers or someone who, I mean, they could have someone of, of trans experience in their family, but often they're not a safe person to disclose to. They would not be someone that's in that inner circle. And, and I'm not sure, you know, how we educate maybe in a way to also change the narrative or, or in the direction of some of these. Yeah, I think, I think educate is absolutely the word of the day. Um, because I think, um, I think several things, I think politicians that engage in attacks on civil rights across the board um, and against children and against trans children um, need to be held accountable and they need to be held accountable accountable by their constituents and by their donors. Um, and I think that is the first thing because I think that politicians will continue to do this until it stops working. And that is a problem. On top of that is this education gap of so many of our leaders in this country don't look like either of us, right? Um, much less um, a trans youth of color. So um, bringing those folks up to speed on the needs of their constituents um, and very basic, you know, to the extent that um, bathroom bills, for example, are very... Um, can be very popular and be very galvanizing for um, certain political factions. In my experience, the folks that are writing those laws don't actually haven't ever been into a women's restroom and don't actually know that there are doors for um, going to the bathroom, for example, um, and that there aren't just urinals. So um, I think that there's, you know, we talk a lot about basic cultural competence for doctors. I think that that sometimes when you're talking about state legislators um, and there, again, there are so many brilliant state legislators and um, public servants out there that um, I really, really applaud. Um, but as far as folks that do need extra education, I think making sure that they're aware of um, the communities that they're impacting and they're regulating. I appreciate that. We have a question here who says, first, thank you so much for sharing. I work in a health research setting and I hear lots of conversations about SOGI data. Are you familiar with that term? I am. Oh, perfect. Okay. I, it's new to me. Do you have any thoughts to share about data collection and the power of data? Holy mackerel. I could talk about data collection all day. Um, so SOGI is sexual orientation and gender identity, um, which is how um, if you're working on the federal federal grants or federal programs, every a lot, almost everything is going to be SOGI collection. Um, so I have, I, have, I have a couple of feelings about this. Um, data collection. So data collection on how different medicines or or um, services impact different people is super important. So you have to look at. Um, cause not every, it's sort of like the old, um, all of the heart disease symptoms are male heart disease symptoms because they don't study women. It's very similar. So I think there's that when you're looking at sort of the NIH stuff. Um, but I think when you're looking at, um, access to coverage or denial of coverage, um, making sure that there are good, there's good information out there is really important. Um, other good federal surveys, um, of youth, like the YRBS, um, can also be really good sort of risk factor surveys for determining how, um, what youth are doing, right? Are they sexually active? Are they um, experiencing with substance abuse? Things that, are, that people don't often wanna hear about, but getting that SOGI data in there, I think is really important. So um, I think it's really powerful um, to have numbers, because otherwise, and it's, you know, when I worked, when I worked at HRC and did all of my public comments, having those numbers of being able to say, this study says this, and it was so powerful when it was an HHS study, right? Or a HUD study or a federally funded study. 
um, as opposed to what could be seen as a political study. So, um, so there's that of Sochi data. Um, the other flip side that I have heard um, and that I don't disagree with um, is that not everybody is going to want to disclose their sexual orientation and gender identity when they go to the doctor. Some people, it's not a choice. Um, others, if if you know that you know, 56% of LGB people report experiencing discrimination in a hospital setting, will choose to pass. And I, actually, it's interesting. So like in my electronic healthcare record, um, when I gave birth, this is a personal story, um, I was going through and it actually says as one of my um, diagnosis, homosexuality. And I gave birth, I know, I gave birth in 2014. Um, and But in my electronic health electronic healthcare record that follow me forever. Yeah. I am a homosexual, which even me, I was like, oh, do I want that? Because you don't know what your care is going to be. So um, I think that that data collection is critical, but we need to do it carefully and compassionately because you also don't want underreporting. Yeah. That was a long answer, but I could talk about SOGI data all day. No, and that makes perfect sense. And we're also seeing that in some of the conversations around the census and what questions were were included and, and how yeah. that was structured because it allows for the distribution of federal resources and, and, all, and is tied to all yeah. kinds of things. Um, and I'm more familiar, I was a social researcher um, for health or human service organizations. And we would use the Williams Institute, some of their data collection mm-hmm. practices and Guidance, which if folks don't know, is the UCLA's um, law school. They have the the Williams Institute that can help. It's often with demographic stuff, but they do a lot of legal research and community based research as well. And I just want to follow up because this is kind of another shade of the question where um, one of the participants, you know, again, thank you, Robin, for the work that you do. I just completed my master's thesis on gender euphoria experienced by trans college students. I agree with you about the importance of telling the joy stories. How do you moderate the issue of collecting data about transness versus the fear of being surveilled or known? Because you touched into that, but to really hone in on, on what that. Is. Yeah, it's it's um, it's really hard. And I don't know that there's an answer because I think that um, to be known is a privilege. And I think that... Um, it also depends on who is paying your, who, who, what coverage you're on for your benefits. You know, are your parents going to get your explanation of benefits mailed to their house? Mm-hmm. Um, and even though you're a 20 year old college student, if your parents are getting, or you're 24, because they've extended to 26, right? If your parents are getting those EOBs, you know, it can be an issue with HIV status as well. It's, it's any, anything, anything sensitive. Um, so I think that it is, it is a hard question. And I think that it is, it goes to the level of strength and um, grit that we, our society demands of trans folks and of, and of, especially young trans folks that are living authentically. Um, I think it's a burden that we don't talk enough about, but then again, I want to be joyful. So it's sort of, it's one of those, I think, I think what I want to say is um, that instead of seeing it as burden, see it as opportunities of strength and that, and really applaud um, the strength of people that live authentically. Well, and the creativity and resiliency yeah. I, in, in a higher, I've been working in a higher ed context for a while and, and just, what it can take to navigate maybe if you know your birth family is not very supportive um just what it takes to reach out build a new community thrive in a higher ed environment Mm -hmm. um and then also navigate like who do you tell how do you manage that you know your chosen name on campus versus having to flip the script maybe in other social contexts versus you know, financial aid, even you yeah. know, having to get your parents' financial data or or their support and, and how you navigate those things. So those, in my mind, again, the social worker speaking, those should always be seen as just just the the skills that are unfortunately asked of trans folks, but at the same time that they wield in so many wonderful ways and support yeah. their own agency and then share with other community members 
and other people have come behind them because there's very much this um, intergenerational support that I've seen the community yeah. need to, to help you and to help others kind of come up maybe with a little bit more ease than yeah. those before them. Yeah. Uh, so we are right at time. At this point, I will just say, are there any final thoughts that you would like to share with the community? Um, no, I just am so grateful to be here. And I'm so grateful for all of you spending the time watching this tonight or the recording. Um, please always feel free to reach out to me at my William at email address. Um, I would love to hear from you. Um, and that's thanks for having me and, and being part of this really important conversation right now. Thank you so very much. And I do want to acknowledge um, that we did not have a speaker of trans experience on this call. So, of course, we may have missed some things. Maybe some of the verbiage we use is not what a member of the community or an individual would choose to use in describing their own experience. So please know that there is always a variation in how people identify, how they come to this, how they experience yeah. all of these issues. But we really thank you for your time. And again, Professor Merrill, thank you so much for sharing your insights and expertise on such an important and unfortunately very prevalent topic yeah. in current news. And um, for those of you who joined us online, we hope you continue to turn into WooStream and we hope that you stay healthy and well. And we look forward to seeing you online sometime soon. Take care everyone and have a lovely evening.